Muy buenas tardes, amados amigos y hermanos presentes y los que están Good afternoon, en diferentes naciones, en la bendición de Cristo, and those who are in different nations. May the blessings of Christ, the angel of the covenant, be upon all of you and also upon me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Let's look in St. Matthew chapter 13. Verses Thirty-six and on. And even starting a bit before that, in verse 34 it says, all these things spake Jesus into the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parables of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear? Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. The ripe wheat. And therefore, it's ready for what? For the reaping, for the harvest. You may be seated if you are so kind. This parable is so important that every human being needs to know it. Because here, Christ puts human beings in two groups, wheats and tares. And every human being must know which of the two groups he's in. Because according to the seed, such will be the fruit. And therefore, the harvest as well. The wheat, as we saw, represents the children of the kingdom, the children of God, and the tares, the children of the wicked one. In other words, Christ taught that there are two types of people, children of God and children of the wicked one. And he says, that the one who sowed the tares is the wicked one.
Therefore, it is important that we know that the wicked one there represents the devil who's always known as the wicked one. The wicked one, the enemy of God, therefore the enemy of Christ, is the wicked one who sowed the bad seed. And now, we find that in the field, there will be wheat and tares, children of God and children of the wicked one. Christ taught that, and therefore, we believe it. Christ himself tells us in St. Matthew, in chapter 15, verse 18, And chapter 15, verse 13 says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, shall be rooted up. In other words, there are plants referring to human beings that Christ says will be rooted up. Rooted up from the planet Earth, from the world, and that will be in the reaping time, the harvest time. The tares will be cast into the furnace of fire, which pertains to the great tribulation where the divine judgments will fall upon the human race and the human beings represented in the tares will be burned with atomic fire volcanic fire too and everything pertaining to the judgment that will fall in the great tribulation. So shall it be at the end of the world. But the wheat will be gathered and placed in God's barn. Now, how will the harvest take place and what interests us the most is the harvest of the wheat the wheat are the ones who hear the word they are the same ones who are represented in the good ground who hear the word, understand it, and bring forth fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. And the good ground, if we read in Hebrews, Chapter 7, 
the good ground as a literal land and the good ground as an individual because the human being, his physical body comes from the dust of the ground. It says, Hebrews 6, 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing and whose end is to be burned. And we see that the good ground is receives blessings from God and what is not good ground which produces thorns thorns and briars that ground is rejected and is near to being cursed. During the Great Tribulation, they will receive the curse of being burned. Every human being wants to be a good ground, good land where the Word of Christ is sown here in the person's heart. Because we all want God's blessing. And the good ground as a territory will also have its fulfillment. Now, it says that the harvest, the reaping, will be at the end of the world, at the end time, at the last day. And how will the harvest take place? Well, Christ himself says, The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The reapers. If there's a harvest, there must be reapers, harvesters. Verse 41 says of this 13th chapter, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. And here, the Son of Man, Christ, will send forth his angels. That is in agreement with what is said further on in St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and on, where it says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There we have the angels of the Son of Man who have been promised to be sent at and for the last day to carry out the relevant work. And
Chapter 16, verse 27 of St. Matthew says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. The Son of Man will come with his angels, and then he will reward every man according to his works. He had said that he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet too. And in chapter 17, verse 1 and on, one and on says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Here we have the order of the coming of the Lord at the last day with Moses and Elijah, who are the ones that will be in charge. Those ministries will be in charge of a very important work that is promised to be carried out at the end time. And that pertains to the sixth seal. Reverend William Branham speaking in the book of the seals, speaking in the seventh seal, here in the book of the seals, on page 458 and 459, he says, page 553 in English, paragraph 173, this time was between the sixth and seventh seal that he calls these people, spoken of by Jesus in Matthew, the 24th chapter and 31st verse, when the trumpet sounds, is the trumpet of the two witnesses of the age of grace for the Jews. One trumpet sounds, and he shall send forth his angels. Not one, see, there's two of them with a great sound of a trumpet. What is it? When God gets ready to speak, there's a sound of a trumpet. That's always his voice. It's calling to battle, see? God speaks. These angels will come forth with the sounding of the trumpet. And did you notice? At the last angel's message, the trumpet sound. The first angel's message, a trumpet sound. Second angel's, a trumpet sounded when he sent it out. Notice, but when the seals were announced, they were all in one great divine thing to call out a group of people. There was one trumpet sound and seven seals were broken. Notice, gather his elected Jews from the four parts of the heavens. Now notice, to call the Jews and especially 144,000, 12,000 of each tribe, the angels of the Son of Man are the ministries of Moses and Elijah, the two olive trees, in the materialization of that promise to call and gather 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 of each tribe at the last day. We are seeing what the angels of the Son of Man are. They are the ministries of Moses and Elijah being repeated at the last day. The ministry of Elijah being repeated for the fifth time. Because you already had the ministry of Elijah, the Tishbite, for the first time. And for the second time, that ministry of Elijah 
which is the Holy Spirit manifested always in a man, manifested in Elijah the Tishbite, operating that ministry. And since it was through him that he carried out all these things back then with the ten tribes of the north, that is, in the kingdom, and with the kingdom of Israel, or also called the kingdom of Ephraim, which pertains to the ten northern tribes. Then the second time that the ministry of Elijah was manifested by the Holy Spirit was in Elisha with a double portion. Then the third time that the ministry of Elijah was manifested by the Holy Spirit was in John the Baptist. And the fourth time that the ministry of Elijah was manifested, it was the Holy Spirit operating that ministry in Reverend William Branham for running the second coming of Christ. Just like the ministry of Elijah operated by the Holy Spirit for ran the first coming of Christ through John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit operating the ministry of Elijah in Reverend William Branham for ran the second coming of Christ. And it is promised that the ministry of Elijah will be manifested again, that the Holy Spirit will operate that ministry. Therefore, wherever the Holy Spirit is at the last day, that is where the ministry of Elijah will operate for the fifth time. The Hebrew people will see that ministry and say, This is Elijah whom I was waiting for, who will be preparing them for the coming of the Messiah. He will be preparing them to receive the Messiah in His coming. And we also had the ministry of Moses there in the deliverance of the Hebrew people operated by the Holy Spirit, the Angel of the Covenant. And if we count the occasion of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in which it was the Holy Spirit through Jesus, if we count that as the second time, then at the last day, we will have a third time that the ministry of Moses will be manifested. But if we don't count that occasion in the first coming of Christ as the second time, then the second time will be at the last day together with the ministry of Elijah. First, they will see Elijah. Then, they will see Moses. And then, they will see the Messiah. And we won't explain that too much so that it still stays that way. What was seen on Mount Transfiguration will be repeated because that is the order of the second coming of Christ with his angels. Remember that those angels, which are, remember that angel means messenger. Moses was God's messenger. Elijah was also God's messenger for his time. In other words, the messenger angels of God. And those are the ministries that are represented in the two olive trees of Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 to 14, and Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 to 14. 
Those are the ministries for the last day. And first we're going to see the ministry of Elijah for the fourth time. We already saw it. And then the ministry of Elijah for the fifth time. Then the ministry of Moses. And then the ministry of Jesus at the last day. It will always be the angel of the covenant, which is Christ in his heavenly body, the Holy Spirit operating those ministries like he operated them through the different prophets from Genesis to Revelation. In other words, the angel of the covenant appeared, let's say, in past times he appeared temporarily veiled in human flesh, in a man. For example, named Moses. And then we also saw him in a man named Samuel just as we had also seen him in a man named Joshua, and we also saw him veiled in a man named Isaiah. We also saw him veiled in a man named Jeremiah, also in a man named Ezekiel, and so on. That is why the scripture says, God, who at sundry times spoke to the fathers by the prophets, how did God speak? Through the prophets. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1 and on. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged her sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, the God who spoke through the prophets then spoke through Jesus. And how did God speak through the prophets? Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11 and on, where it tells us, But they refused to hear him and pulled away their shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yeah, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. In other words, the way God speaks to the people is through a man, through a veil of flesh. And to do that, God speaks through his Holy Spirit, which is the angel of the covenant, which is Christ in his heavenly body, the image of the living God, and he veils himself in human flesh 
in a man, in a prophet. And through that man, God, through his Holy Spirit, speaks to his people. The scripture says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In other words, he has made him known. In other words, the people who saw God, who said that they saw God when they saw, what they saw was God's heavenly body, which is the angel of the covenant, Christ in his heavenly body, called the Holy Spirit. There is a divine order for God to reveal himself to the people and for God to speak to the people. The person who doesn't know that order will have no knowledge about the time in which he lives, will have no knowledge about the message relevant to his time, because the message, the promised word for each time is what God fulfills in his manifestation relevant to that time. That is where we will find God manifested and veiled through the instrument that he has for that age and God revealed through his spirit, through the angel of the covenant, through the individual whom he veils and reveals himself in each stage of the divine program. The Apostle Paul said in his time, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It was Christ in St. Paul veiled through the Holy Spirit that was in St. Paul. He said, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Christ in Holy Spirit and revealed through St. Paul to the Gentiles, bringing them to the knowledge of the divine program of redemption, to thus call the sheep that he had at that time among the Gentiles, to thus call the people for his name, whom he has been calling from stage to stage from among the Gentiles, who form the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people may say that they have gotten into religion or that they will not get into religion. Well, notice any person can join or not join any religion. But that means absolutely nothing. Now, Entering into the kingdom of God, that sure means something. It means the eternal future, the life of the human being in the kingdom of God, for which the person must be born again of the water and of the spirit of the gospel of Christ and of the spirit of Christ. There is no other way to enter into the kingdom of God. That is the only way that Christ said there is. Furthermore, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Therefore, there is no other way that leads the human being to God. Christ is the way that was open for the human being to reach God. And now, since every person who is born into the kingdom of God, through the union of Christ and his church, from stage to stage, reproducing himself in sons and daughters of God and 
since Christ is the corn of wheat of which Christ said, except the corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. In other words, many wheat grains. St. John 12, verse 24. And in order for the corn of wheat that is sown into the ground to bring forth fruit, well, a wheat plant must sprout. Christ is the corn of wheat where life is. And the church that was born on the day of Pentecost is the wheat plant. And the fruit of that wheat plant are sons and daughters of God. The members of the mystical body of Christ who have been born into the kingdom of God. As simple as that. And since the corn of wheat, the wheat plant, in the parable of the wheat and the tares of St. Matthew chapter 13, verses 30 to 43, will be harvested at the end of the world, at the harvest time, at the reaping time, which is also summertime, because harvest is in summertime. We don't harvest in the winter, but in the summer. Wheat and barley are harvested in the summer, especially wheat in summertime. That is why Christ, the Son of Man, the Angel of the Covenant, will send His angels, those ministries of Moses and Elijah, to carry out the harvest, the gathering with the great voice of trumpet, which is the voice of God, through the Spirit of God, speaking to His people at the last day, speaking in His church. And His voice will spread to every place that must be reached by the message of the great voice of trumpet, the last trumpet, which precedes the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living and prepares them, the living, for the transformation. All the ones who are going to be transformed will be in the mystical body of Christ at the last day. And the ones who are going to be resurrected in their time, they were in the mystical body of Christ. Because it is for the believers in Christ that the resurrection is promised in immortal bodies, young bodies, glorified bodies, just like the glorified body of Jesus Christ. They are the wheat, a product of Christ, the corn of wheat. They are the children of God through the corn of wheat. Christ, Christ the second Adam, bringing forth or reproducing himself in sons and daughters of God. That is the family of God, the church of the living God, the temple of God, where God dwells in each believer. And in that group of believers, Whenever they gather, God is always with them and among them. In order for the wheat to ripen, it must be receiving the sun, the warmth of the summer sun. The sun that will prepare them for the harvest, the sun that will ripen them. And the promised word 
for each age in its fulfillment brings forth the sons and daughters of God of each stage. And the revealed word for the last day, the promised word in its fulfillment, will produce or bring forth and prepare the wheat which will be in the presence of the sun cross because it will no longer be in the stage of the moon but in the stage of the sun. It is very important to know that. It will no longer be in any of the seven stages of the past church which pertain to the seven stages represented in seven moon stages. They will go up higher because the past ages in the past three stages of justification, sanctification, and gifts of the Spirit, the Lutheran Age, Wesleyan Age, and then Pentecostal Age, were the bearers of the corn of wheat, of the life that would form the corn of wheat inside the shuck which is the seventh age. And then, from there would come, would emerge the corn of wheat at the last day, which will ripen by receiving the light of the sun higher than the age of the shuck, higher than the seventh age, which pertains to the eternal age, the golden age of the church, the age of the cornerstone. That is where the wheat will mature so that it can be harvested in the kingdom of God. All those who will receive the visit of the believers in Christ who are going to be resurrected in eternal bodies will be there and when they see them, those who are alive will be transformed. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be in that stage of the church of the last day, receiving the light of the revealed word for the last day and watching the promised word as it materializes. And every time that one of those promises is materialized, they will say, this was written. And if it was written for a time, for this end time, it must be materialized, if it was as a divine promise. And the forerunner of the second coming of Christ, Reverend William Branham, with the Holy Spirit operating in the ministry of Elijah for the fourth time, prepared the way and made known things that will be taking place at this end time. Just as John the Baptist also prepared the way for the Lord. We find John the Baptist speaking of the Messiah and making known the things that the Messiah will do. The things he did and the ones he will do at the end time. Look at chapter 3 of St. Matthew. John the Baptist says in verses 11 to 12, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, 
But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. At the end time, or last day, it will be in this same way. Christ will be the one who will produce the resurrection of the dead in Christ and our physical transformation at the last day. And the one who will gather the wheat operating the ministries relevant to the angels of the harvest, which are the ministries of Moses and Elijah. And those ministries will also impact the Hebrew people at the last day. We are in the time relevant to those divine promises. Therefore, with our spiritual eyes wide open, let's be watchful of which are the promises for this end time, and let's watch how they gradually get fulfilled until they are completely fulfilled. And when we see these things, the signs that it has been said, it will be seen at the last day in the end time, let's lift up our heads to heaven, for our redemption is near. And therefore, Let's lift up our heads to the heavenly age where we will be receiving the revelation of the promised word for this and time. The church, the one that will be transformed will have the power of revelation. Remember that revelation is a power. Therefore, with that power, by Christ revealing himself to her, he gives that power to his church. And thus he gives her the keys of the divine revelation to make known these things which must shortly come to pass. We are very close to our transformation when we see the things that were for run taking place, there are many that are physical signs. Let's have our eyes wide open and our lives fixed before Christ because our redemption, the redemption of the body, the transformation is near. And whoever has had his spiritual eyes wide open has been seeing that the things that have been promised already started being fulfilled. Some are also in the process of being fulfilled. Others have already been fulfilled and so on. And the things that haven't yet will also be fulfilled because the wheat has been maturing as the sun 
in the age of the sun, the golden age of the church, shines upon us and warms us with the revealed word for our time, with the rays of light of the revelation. In order to know the things that must come to pass at this time, identify the things that have already come to pass and the things that are in the process of being fulfilled. Heavens and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Christ said. Therefore, let's be attentive because we are ripening in order to be harvested in the kingdom of Christ to be transformed if we remain alive until that moment of the transformation. But if someone leaves before, don't worry. He will return with Christ in the resurrection. In the meantime, well... He will be watching what will be happening over here from paradise, from the sixth dimension. The only thing that he can no longer work because his time on earth already ended. He will be more comfortable there speaking in those terms, but he will wish to be here in order to work. But each person gets a period of time to be here and work in the work of the Lord. And when that time is fulfilled, the best thing that can happen to the person is for God to tell him, My faithful servant, come, rest now. You have already carried out the work that pertain to you and now it's time to rest. Just think, if God didn't call to rest or sleep because saints don't die, they sleep. If those of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth stages didn't sleep, there would be millions of believers in Christ and earth. Some would be hundreds of years old and others thousands of years old. But when we are in the millennium, then we will spend hundreds of years and a thousand years in that kingdom and then for all eternity. the ripe wheat. Christ says that when the wheat ripens, then the harvest comes. And the harvest, it says, who else can carry out the harvest but the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord Brother Branham, Reverend William Branham says, as it applies to the angels of the harvest who make the separation between the wheat and the tares. In other words, it will be a work of the Lord Jesus Christ operating those ministries at the last day. He that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Therefore, onward, and always persevering, knowing that as it is written, so will it be. 
The important thing is to be holding on tight to Christ. And most of all, in this stage in which we're living, always feeding ourselves with the word of Christ, the Son of Righteousness, and thus being ripened until we reach the point where we are harvested with our transformation, the rapture or catching away to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Once the wheat is ripe, it will be taken to God's garner. It will be taken to the house of God for the marriage supper of the Lamb. See why this parable is so important for human beings? Because what it says here shows us what the future of the wheat and the future of the tares will be. And we can say clearly and unequivocally that the tares have no future. The future of the tares will be the lake of fire. The future of the wheat will be the kingdom of God. May y'all continue to have a happy evening filled with the blessings of Christ, our Savior. I leave with you the relevant minister in each country.